Roman Dazel here, returning to the lands of Middle-earth for the Middle-earth role-playing game. Today we're going to be looking at the Empire of the Witch King. You can hear my wife's music in the background. I can't stand the weekend, but what can you do? Anyway, this is 4020, or 4020 of the series. And it's the last of the 80s campaign modules. And it's the last serial number of the campaign modules for the second edition. First and second edition. And this one was made in 1989. I bought this out of probably Imperial Hobbies for like 25, 30 bucks. And this is a remake of the original Angmar Land of the Witch King. So this one is gonna have, this one's gonna have a lot of the same material as the other one. And we'll just gloss over those ones. But this one does have a lot of new material, which is really cool, which makes it better than the Mirkwood book. Now, if you remember in the first one, this is what the map looked like. This was the, the map they used in the first one. Not as well detailed. And they improved upon it by putting in more detail, making it look more realistic. Uh, unfortunately, they did something. They cut. This section of Rudar does not match the actual map. And that really sucks. It would be more like that. For this part to match that part, it's missing. And even in this section, it doesn't match what's going on here. So it's out of whack. I wish they had not done that. I wish they made one continuous map that makes sense and, and hooks up with the Arthedinian and Cardolan maps. But that's what they did. Now on the back, you have a Karn Doom, which is really, which is a pretty cool fortress. I can see why the Arthedinians never attempted to even try to take it. Being so far north, out of the way, whether you'd only have a certain amount of campaign season to go up there, and you would need more men to totally surround it all the time while getting hit by orc raids. So the Arthedinians never seriously attempted to take the fortress. Though they probably could have. The Arthedinians would... Elves from Linden, Dwarves from Moria, and Elves from Rivendell, as well as any Cardellani troops they could pull, and even Gondorians. They could have probably done it, but it wasn't until 1975 of the Third Age when the, when the Witch King was totally defeated by, by the Gondorians and Elves that they went and sacked the city and tore it apart. But I'm surprised the Witch King never tried to reoccupy this area of Karndum, if it was that big of a fortress. So let's go back to this book. First off, they give you a pretty cool uh, insert of the Orcish cave system and Orcish stockade. So this would be, you know, typical Orcish cave system and a typical stockade along the trade routes, guarding certain areas for the Witch King. That's the first thing right away that came up. Introduction and background. We'll skip through this. And then the observation of a spy. This is like a story of a guy who, who spent an Arthedinian spy who went through the entire Witch King's realm in observing stuff. So this is his story. It's pretty cool. It gives a lot of backstory. You have the land, the climate, troll hole. These are things that are already in the original book, so we're just going to go skim through them because they're not important. Now, when it goes to peoples and culture... It, the original book described the Angmaran and gave some names, but this book goes into much more greater detail of the peoples of note, the peoples and culture. It went through the Hillmen and the Dunlendings, which you can get more from Hillmen of the Trollshaws, which is an earlier book. But it goes through what the Ruderim so soldiers were like, because these are people out of Rudar. The Astaravi, which were the original Northmen inhabitants on the eastern side of the Misty Mountains. 
they were more or less conquered by the Witch King and forced to serve him and eventually became evil. They were later driven out by the Eothram, who became the Ethiod, up in the Burfram area of the Upper Anduin. You have the Easterlings, so the Easterlings could be anything from R the Rune area to even further east, nomadic tribes of the plains. And they're called Runish peasants. A lot of them are immigrated or given lands in Angmar and in the Olad, Oilad. Then, of course, you're going to have your mixed men. So you're going to have your mixed men as well as Felmen of the uh, Trollsha areas. And there are also other wandering peoples, like the Lossoth of the north. And, of course, you have slaves. So that was something new. And a random settlement generation. Next up, this is the Uruk Angmer. This is something the other book never did go into. This is really cool. It gives you all the tribes that are in the region. See, Ashke, Bagarnas, Durbalag, Falkrum, Kukurum, Largmosh, Lughoth, Skruthge, Skruthge, Dark Murderers, Snagoth, Silmogvraz, Topper, Drash, Thrak Burzum, Trupalog, Ulag Garum, the Urof Burm, Urogash, and Urokosh, Urok Luga, and the Urok Flag, and then the Zem Vishtrak are the last ones. So it gives you a pretty good representation of the tribes in, their, in the areas, which I found was really cool. And it breaks down their military as well. Politics and power. Something new, you got the Priesthood of Angmar, which is new, and the Cult of the Dark Overlord. So now it gives a Saronic Priestum. Tolkien never really mentions dark cults too much. He hints at it, but doesn't really, as the slaves worship Sauron or and fear him at the same time. Ritual practices in Angmar, religion among soldiers, the re religion in Karndum. You have the cult of the Mor Morag Sarag, the Black Blood, which are assassins dedicated to the Lord of Death. Nine initiates who are full ranking members and 18 asso initiate, associates, acolytes, sorry. 18 acolytes. Angulin is the chief initiate. And the Witch King is, of course, the master. And it gives you a list of all those in the Morsareg and the Angmarian priesthood. Basically, preaching hate for the West. Going into peoples of note gives the general powers and features of Nazgul, as well as everything about the Witch King. The Witch King is the most mentioned ring wraith in the entire Lord of the Rings world, as well as in the Middle Earth role playing world. And gives his whole backstory and what he, do, what he does up until his death. Then we have the Angulin, who's the most powerful mortal in the service of the Necromancer. A second age Numenorian who is the cousin to Akorahil, the Nazgul. So this guy, I don't believe this is something that Merp takes out of context. Kind of like the mouth of Sauron, who's the same idea. But the Angulin would not be as powerful as the Witch King and probably... He's definitely a fictional character within the Lord of the Rings universe. The Mornaturi, who are the generals, gives a... This was also in the original book, but they go more in a backstory with these guys. Danku is the chief general, and he's got Ulrak, Durkarian, Durax, Syker, and Kirsch. They're all generals and command, command certain regions. Let me go into something else. You have the High Priest, the Golmathar. You have an elf, Camthalian, he's evil cleric. Alduin is the half-orc evil animus sorcerer. And you have Algarin, a half-elf, us animus astrologer. They're the three high priests. So that was kind of cool to go through. I'm doing this really quickly because a lot of this is already mentioned in the other book. Warcraft. So Warcraft is mentioned in the other book, but this one goes into much more details. The, the military organization, the weapons in the Angmarin, siege equipment, history, chain of command, the orc host. So there are 12 main orc tribes, but there are as many as 30 in the surrounding area. Of course, you're going to have trolls. You have the, the body of the Horkal, they're called. So there's a, a mannish contingent as well as a troll one. Crossbowmen, trackers. Then we get into the trade routes. And fortifications. So you got great fortifications, lesser fortifications, and beacon towers. Life on the, and it goes into life on the frontier. Un and Unendoriath, which is no man's land between Arthenian and Agmar. Border watches, communications, Junadine. There are a couple of dragons in the area. And then the Agmarian strategy, which is just born of attrition. 
to wear down the, the spirit and numbers of, of the Dunedain residing in Arthedain. It effectively worked in Rudar and, and to a lesser extent in Cardolan. Remember, it takes almost almost 600 years from the foundation of Angmar, or 700 years from the foundation of Angmar in the 13th century all the way up to the 20th century for Angmar to finally overcome Arthedain. That is a long time. I don't think there's anything quite like it in the annals annal of our history, where one power continuously wears, tries to wear down another power. The closest thing I could think of would be the, the Roman Empire and the, the Parthians and the Sassanians constantly were fighting each other throughout much of the Roman history, but neither could gain an upper hand. In fact, they fought each other to the point of exhaustion so that the Arabs were able to burst out and take over. So he goes into Carndoom. This is just basically the same as the other book. It gives more description. They give more uh, descriptions in the rooms and what you can find. That's the only difference. Other than that, the layouts are pretty much the same. And they're pretty cool layouts. Barad Morke is one of the f four major forts guarding the plain of Angmar. And it gives a de detailed description of the garrison life troops, NPC characters. Nothing new there. Just gives more descriptions. And then it gives border border beacon towers like the Mindel Kargish, which would be a s small beacon tower. Barad Aldaner, which was once in our Junadain keep in the north, but is now Agmarin. Now this is one, a section that's totally new. It's called the Lughil Sarak. My pronunciation sucks. Awful fragment. This is supposed to be a, one of the pieces of the great lamps that the Valor built when they when the world was first formed, and it gave light. There were two of them, one on each end of the one in the north, one in the south. And Morgoth came and destroyed them. And this is supposed to be an, uh, a piece of this of the northern one. And the Witch King uses it, built a tower around it, and uses it to change the weather. Now this is something Merp created because Tolkien never mentions that kind of stuff. But he does Tolkien does mention how there was a change in climate when the Witch King was in the north. So something like that could be possible. But highly unlikely. Then you have some Agmarin towns, Kuska, it's mentioned in the other book. This would be a typical village. There wouldn't be many of these because the the way the climate works in Angmar and the soil, there, you wouldn't be able to really survive. Angmar basically survives on supply trains from all of, from Rune that would go up past the Iron Hills and through the Arid Mithrin area in northern Mirkwood. So hitting that area between the mountain and the forest. Any serious attempt to disrupt the supply chain would have conse major consequences in Angmar to feed all the troops and people. Rudar would be able to supply some needs, but and so would the Olia, the the empty lands, but for the most part, they rely on supply trains from Rune. You have villagers to note. Another town that they don't mention in the book is called the Latash Ishi Derbaz. It guards the uh, pass between Angmar and the Andunan Vales. And it gives you a description of the town life, the lower town, the upper town. This is where the priesthood just resides. And it controls, the, and it's a very controlling point. It gets into Ravda, which would be a wood fort, a small outpost to guard, to guard the supply routes. Because again, once you interdict that supply route, you're in a lot of trouble. Unfortunately, the Gondorians and the, Arth the Arthedanians could never get any troops over the Misty Mountains and, and hit their supply lines. Neither could the Gondorians. Uh, the elves of Mirkwood might be able to, but it was probably too far for them. And the dwarves weren't in Erebor at that time, but they were in the Iron Hills. They wouldn't have the strength either to interdict supply routes. And it goes into a full Falactar, Falachar, which is basically a lost author, nomad, longhouses. Then we go into orc holes. This is all new stuff, which is pretty cool. This. Skuthrugrai, the Dark Murderers. They reside just in northern Rudar, on the lower skirts of the Misty Mountains. And they have a couple orc holes called Storogruz, and it gives descriptions. The cave, the mines, the caves. Pretty cool stuff. Goes into tribal their tribal organization. Next up we got the Uruk Lugat, another orc tribe in the Rudarm region, in the foothills of Magmar. And look at their lands. 
haunted sites, the Urukosh. It's another orc tribe. They reside on the cold plain in Angmar itself. So they have some lands and it gets into their major site on a hill. Always like how they include the harem. You got a harem here. Reserved for the chieftain. I'm oh, sorry, it's the female orcs. Other than those reserved for the chieftain are quartered here. The chambers are generally dirty and unkept for the orcs and, and afford their females few comforts and see them only as a means of gratification as producers of the next generation of warriors. Females have no other function in the palace and perform no duties. Indeed, they are rarely allowed out of this small complex of rooms. Talk about a shitty life. You got the Urukosh war host. And goes into pretty good detail about them. Notable warriors. Next up, we got ancient sites. Sorantar's mound and Sor Sonatar's prophecy. And how the how a chieftain slew the sage and was cursed for it. it gives a whole backstory. It's pretty cool to, to, to learn. And you can go to the actual site of the prophecy. And there's some stuff you can get there. Then it goes Daron's Pool and Daron's Lament. Daron was a first age elf who loved Luthien. But she loved Baron. And because of his love for Luthien, he, he was a very good, probably one of the greatest, if not the greatest song songwriter and singer among the elves. But because of his love for Luthien drove him to, into exile. He couldn't bear it. So supposedly he came to the Misty Mountains and created a place for himself. And you can go there and feel safe, but you're going to have uncontrollable things happen to you because it's... So it's a very depressing place. Then you got As As Carnell's place. As Carnell is an elf from Rivendell. He's listed in the Rivendell book, and he is a spy for Rivendell in the in the Northern Rudarian Age area. And he keeps himself in this old Dunedain manor that's run down and ruined. So that's where he bodes. So that's kind of cool. Next, we got creating a mer military priest, so you can become one of the evil guys or even an orc character. If you want to become one of them, you can. And it gives you all the lists of professions. You can use the Merp rules for that. Bronze Age, Iron Age, whether it be a mountain, hills, or plains. Orc, Yurk, or Half Orc. Warrior, Scout, Wolf Rider, a Shaman, or a Tracker. That's pretty cool. And the Orcish weapons. The original Angmar book never really went much into the uh, Orcs. They just concentrate on managed things. You get the languages in Middle Earth Kingdom because there will be so many different languages. Especially among the uh, men. And of course the orcs. Orcish glossary. So it goes into the orcish language. Which is kind of cool. Not that it mean, Not that you're ever going to use this really. But it is something they, they added. And it's kind of cool. You can design a castle. Designing a small outpost. Raids and sorties. Supplies for outposts and castles. Herb Lord of the Dunedain. Suggested adventures. You can go to the Witch King's Fortress City. To be a spy. Take on Scorba the Worm, Dragons and Well Trolls, try and get into Mor Baron Morke, the Anunnariath. So there's not much for the adventures. They don't have any real concrete adventures that you can follow. You're pretty much on your own. I have sent guys up into the northern Rudar and Angmar, but not really too extensively. You need to be a really high level to get into Karn Doom. Low level guys are going to get themselves killed. Next, Herbs and Drugs. Angmar at other times, so you beginning of the third age and the early fourth age. Really, Angmar is only from 12, 1250 of this to about 1780 of the third age was when it becomes relevant. After that, it falls into obscurity and the population declines. So the Master Beast Table, Master Military Table. This is better than the original because it gives the orc, all the orc tribes. And I've used this extensively in my military campaigns. The Angmar and Lords. So that all the NPCs they need. And the Master Encounter Tables. And then it gives a Orcish Earthwork Village in the insert. So that's it in a very short nutshell. I didn't spend a lot of time going in detail. Because it's a big book. And most of it was covered in the original. It is an upgrade from the original book by far. If I wasn't a collector, if I was just wanting to get the best book available, I'd buy this one instead of the first edition. But it is what it is. I like the cover art. It's pretty cool. And it looks like they're attacking Fornost. This is the final stage. So I would definitely recommend this book. It's got a lot of good information. It's great for if you want to do a master military campaign between the force of Angmar, Arthur, Ankardal, and Arudar. 
and is a must for that. Anyway, anyone else out there, let me know what you guys, if you guys had this. Um, what you guys thought of the book? Did you guys adventure with it? I know I we tried to take on uh, Scorber the Worm and Cro the two dragons that were in the region. We tried to get both of them. Took on some minor border posts and we did the Four Kings scenario. Anyway, leave comments below and let me know. Until next time, this has been Roman Daisel. I'm out of here.